I'll just do that instead. Sure. Okay. So it's on now, though? This it isn't? Is, yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. I'm about to start, really. Okay, so uh, we're getting close to the midpoint of the quarter, which means it's time to start thinking about the midterm, um, which is one of my least favorite parts of this class. I'm sure it will be one of your least favorite too, because uh, what's fun about taking an exam? Um, in preparation for that, there's a couple different things that are relevant. We will be getting a practice exam online for you sometime this week. It'll probably be Thursday or Friday. Um, so that'll get posted on the course website. Okay. There will be a practice exam as well as a separate document with the answers to the exam. I recommend not looking at that one first. Um, yeah, so uh, there will also be a review sheet that gets posted there as well. The review sheet will only be related to what you need to know from section. Okay. Um, and then the other thing is next Monday, 5 o'clock, this room uh, will be the review session. Okay, 5 p.m. in here. Yes? What? Oh, sorry, there was no need to vote. There was only one time that the registrar could do it. So we can take a vote, and then it would end up being that time, because that's the only time. I asked what the range of times were that they could give us a room with the intention of having folks come in and vote, but they said that was the only time. So it's Monday at 5. I have a request in to have someone uh, give me, uh, to set it up basically so that it can be audio podcast so that for those of you who can't be here, you can hear the answers. Okay. 
Um, I will also be having my office hours next week on Wednesday before the exam itself. So uh, if those things aren't good enough options, you can certainly email me and we can try to figure out some other option as well if there's additional questions. Uh, but usually those two end up covering most people for most of the questions that they have. Um, so I do not have confirmation yet that it will be podcast. I have a request in to have it podcast. But in the past, we've had success. Does anyone in here record the lectures on their own like device? Usually there's a few people who do. No? You do back there? And does it come out as like an MP3 or something on your computer? You don't know. Okay. Someone tries to remind me, I will try to also record that review session on my phone um, because we do have problems on occasion with getting that thing posted as one of the regular podcasts uh, with everything else. And so if we have our own copy, i.e. I make a copy on my phone, uh, that will ensure that we'll be able to get it posted somewhere. Yep. Till uh, six or six thirty. So we have the room till six thirty. Traditionally, um, they've lasted about an hour or a little less, but I can stay till six thirty until the room ceases to be ours. Um, yeah. So and in that review session, uh, I will be talking about uh, lecture review material. So if there are questions about the section review material. Those questions should be going to your TAs. Um, occasionally, someone comes to um, my office hours and says, I want to ask you about uh, Ellen Langer's book, Mindfulness. And I say, well, OK, that would make sense if I had read that book in the last 15 years, but I haven't. Um, so I'm assigning books that I like and have known well in the past, but I don't keep reading them every quarter, your TAs do, because they're the ones who are actually teaching from those books. So if there's questions for section, question for the books, those questions should be going to your TA. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Right. So what will be posted is a practice exam that includes some questions that are focused on the book. But the review sheet will tell you very clearly, this is the material you need to know from the books. Um, for the most part, when we ask questions from the books, we want them to be questions that if you read the books, you get them right. The idea is, is that we want there to be an incentive for you to read the books. And essentially, getting some right on the midterm is, is a good way to do that. If I didn't have them ever required, there's a good portion of you that would never read any of the books, unfortunately. But that's human nature. I would have done the same thing when I was an undergrad, um, or this week if I was in your situation. It hasn't really changed. Um, so yeah, so that's the way we do it. I think there isn't, right? We canceled section for next week. OK, there was something about Wednesday from Thanksgiving. Is that the? Oh, right. So because the Wednesday sessions uh, won't have section on Veterans Day, the Wednesday sections of next week, I guess, are meeting. Check with your TA. Check with your TA. So if you're not on a Wednesday, you're not having section next week. Any other questions? OK, the only other thing I have to warn you of is that at the end of lecture today, I literally need to run out of here. And people should never say literally when they don't mean it. I'm not going to actually run. Um, but I need to leave. Basically, the second lecture ends because I'm giving a talk across campus 10 minutes after this class is over. Um, so I will need to leave. And I won't be able to uh, take questions after like I usually like to be able to do. So how many questions on the midterm? Was that it? Uh, I don't know exactly at this point, but typically it's 45 to 50 multiple choice questions. Uh, it's a Scantron. We'll bring the Scantrons. Please bring number two pencils. Uh, we'll have the stubby, embarrassing pencils if you don't bring your own. But those don't come with eraser. So if you don't bring your own pencil, make sure you get it right the first answer you put down. Um, and almost everybody finishes well before the hour and 15 minutes that you have. I know this historically. 
There will be five to seven people who will stay to the end, but I know from experience that they would stay till the end if the exam was six hours long and you still had the same number of questions I'm giving you. So for the vast majority of you, you will finish at about 40 minutes. Um, it's not a real long exam. And just to let you know, the final exam will be the same way. So you'll have more time for the final, same number of questions. It'll take you the same amount of time, roughly speaking. The regular green scan. I've never seen a green Scantron at UCLA. It's the white Scantron with like red, blue boxes or something on it, but it will be a standard Scantron with spaces for you to fill in and a way for us to grade it without doing any work. Like that one right back there. She's holding one up. Okay. All right. So, at the end of last lecture, we had talked about Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, talking about these sort of two motivational forces within each person. Right? This is the era in which uh, the folks who were talking about the self were talking about the parts of the self that are kind of at war with one another. Okay? And so... Um, Nietzsche talked about them in terms of the Apollonian and the Dionysian forces, and he doesn't talk about all of these things per se, but rather I think that if we sort of look at these different characteristics, we can talk about how you might think about them differently within kind of the Apollonian versus the Dionysian system. And the other thing to notice about this is the way it kind of maps on to the uh, Who Am I demo we did at the beginning of this lecture last time or two times ago, okay? Um, and so most of what people answer, when they answer the question, who am I, they're doing things that put them squarely kind of on the Apollonian side of things. So they say things about who they are rather than what they're doing, right? Right now, I could say I am a teacher, okay? But when I say I am a teacher, it's presupposing that that's an enduring, stable characteristic that will kind of just last indefinitely. Some would argue that it's a lot more accurate for me to define myself right now in terms of the fact that I am teaching. Okay? And it turns out that there's psychological consequences based on which of those two ways you think about yourself when you're doing different things. Okay? And I'm not going to go into that, but there are consequences. When you use this, you're basically using nouns and adjectives to describe yourself as opposed to verbs and adverbs to describe yourself. Um, because you're talking about enduring characteristics, you're tending to refer to sort of things that occurred in the past and will endure into the future rather than what's actually happening right now. Um, we'll come back to this when we talk about William James a little bit later today, but when we get to William James and talk about the I versus the me, it ends up kind of dividing up this way. That'll make a little bit more sense um, then. All right. Now, Nietzsche said one other thing that um, I think is profoundly important for social psychology and, and sort of social psychological perspectives on the self, and in fact, the entire next lecture that we're going to do after this one. So um, he wrote, and, and like many philosophers, they, they like to be offensive and, and uh, offend our sensibilities uh, as much as they can, and so uh, he wrote... Um, that whatever they may think and say about their self, the great majority, i.e., all of you, okay, the great majority nonetheless do nothing for their self their whole life long. What they do is done for the phantom of their self, which has been formed in the heads of those around them and communicated to them. Okay? And so what he's suggesting here is you have your sort of ingrained sense of self. You think it's personal, you think it comes from you, that it's something that emanates from you. It's special, unique, and it's yours. And what he's suggesting is that is an illusion. Okay? Those things that you feel intimately connected to as your own, your own beliefs, your own preferences, your own identity, are all things that have been profoundly shaped by forces outside of you in ways that we do not recognize most of the time. And most of those forces 
are geared towards making us have identities and values that end up benefiting society and maybe or maybe not benefiting us personally. Okay. Um, so, putting this in the terms of you know, what we were just talking about with Apollonian and Dionysian, what he suggests is that society is basically helping you construct the Apollonian side of yourself. To have a particular set of rules, norms, beliefs, values, all the things associated with your culture, perhaps your family. Okay. But once they get inside us, we think they're really ours, and somehow they came from us. Okay. And so, um, you know, one example that I, I tend to go back to um, is, you know, the, the freshman who shows up at college prepared to go to med school. Okay? You all either are or know this person. Okay? Half the people I went to school with were this person. And sometime during freshman or maybe sophomore year, a lot of these folks realize this is a terrible idea. I'm terrible at organic chemistry, right? I, I don't think I like any of this. I'm scared of the sight of blood, right? And I really want to be a choreographer. <laughs> Not me, but I was having dinner last night with someone who dropped out of med school to become a choreographer, uh, but then went back to med school. Right? So people will go through high school working so hard to get the best grades they can, to go to the best college they can, because they're dead set on becoming a doctor. Okay. Why? Well, in my family, the reason why anyone ever wanted to become a doctor is because I had a Jewish grandmother who, from the time I was very little, said, don't you want to be a doctor? <laughs> we need a doctor in the family. Right? And I said, doesn't a PhD count? That's a doctor? Said, no. No, that doesn't count. My brother's name is Daniel Roberts. His initials are doctor. No, doesn't count. Okay. But in a lot of families, this gets in. And we internalize kind of what our parents or our grandparents or our society tells us about what would be a good thing for us to do. And we embrace that and we go sort of full steam at it without actually knowing what it is that we're now wishing for, right? When a 14-year-old decides they want to be a doctor, what do they know about what a doctor does, right? Do they know about dealing with malpractice insurance? Probably not. Do they know about dealing with HMOs? Probably not, right? There are many things that are great about being a doctor. There are many things that are terrible about being a doctor, and certain people really have a temperament suited to being a surgeon or being a general practitioner. But there's a lot of other people that because our society values having doctors, people get encouraged and they come to internalize that in a way that as they get older they realize that doesn't actually suit me. But it's very hard to go through that transition because we really do internalize those things that come from those around us. Okay? Um, and sometimes when I talk about this people say, why are you picking on doctors? Right? I'm not. Doctors are awesome. We'd all be in a lot of trouble without them. That's kind of why this phenomenon occurs. It's because they are so valuable to society um, that it sets up this um, sort of uh, circular process where people are more generically encouraged to become docu doctors than may fit their kind of temperament and so on. But you could do it for anything else that was very highly valued, I'm sure. Okay. So um, our last group of philosophers, and now we start bleeding into people who are both philosophers and psychologists who think big. Um, here's the, the, there's a bit of a more mishmash of ideas, and things get a lot more kind of postmodern seeming at this point. Yeah. Why does what? Oh, why does he have the image of being crazy? Oh, because he went crazy. <laughs> I mean, he, like, in the last 15 years of his life, like, just literally lost his mind. You know, he was, like, running around throwing feces on the wall. Kind of crazy. Crazy. Yeah. 
Um, now, other people think he's crazy because they, don't dis, you know, because they don't agree with him. But here we go back to our very good example of the reasonable person standard, and you think, well, he makes sense to me, therefore, why would anyone else think he's crazy? Okay, and if I put that as an exam question, that would be an instance of... Anyone? Oh, <laughs> well, you got some studying to do. Well, it involves subjective construal, but what he did would be an example of naive realism. I heard someone, heard someone say it. Naive realism. Okay. Um, but I feel the same way, because I don't think he's crazy either. Everyone who disagrees, you're the crazy ones. I'm kidding. What? He was German. As am I. Us Germans, we stick together. No, I'm kidding. I went to Germany once. Not a real fun place to visit. Anyway. Uh, Germany? Uh, Hawaii. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, okay. Okay, but let's leave Germany and go to France. Okay. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre okay. uh, wrote a book called Transcendence of the Ego that I and six other people in the world have ever read because it is not a very well-known book of his, but it's a really insightful book. Uh, and, and in this, he, he wrote the following. He wrote, there is no I on the unreflected level. When I run after a streetcar, when I look at the time, when I am absorbed in contemplating a portrait, there is no I. There is consciousness of, quote, the streetcar having to be overtaken, in fact, I am then plunged into a world of objects. It is they which constitute the unity of my consciousness. It is they which present themselves with values, with attractive and repellent qualities. But me, I have disappeared. I have annihilated myself. There is no place for me on this level. Okay? So he's no longer debating whether the self exists or not. What he's suggesting is that the identity that we sort of think of when we think about ourselves is often not actually there. It's there when we stop to think about it. It's like the refrigerator. When you open the door, you see the light on. Okay? When you close the door, you assume the light is still on because you didn't see it go off. But it's only there when you pull the door open and, and look at the light. Okay? And what he's suggesting is the self is kind of the same way. The self is there whenever you go look for it, which is odd because Hume said the opposite, right? But, you know, I can be reflecting on myself, and that can be taken as the action of the self, evidence for the self, and Kant's perspective sort of supports that. But he said, most of the time in my life, I'm running around doing things, and that self that I identify with, there's no evidence of it. I'm busy living life. Okay, there's experience, but not me thinking about my experience. And so this goes back to Descartes. Descartes said, I cannot doubt that I exist because I would be doubting that I exist. But when Descartes's doing that, he's engaged in very reflective, conscious acts. And what Sartre is essentially saying is, what if Descartes wasn't busy doubting right now? Would he still exist? I mean, as a person, yes, but would his self exist? And Sartre questions that, and I think that's an interesting thing to question. Again, you don't have to agree with him, but I think it's an interesting perspective to say, when I'm busy living my life, where is that I that I think is so central to me that I'm doing all this stuff for? Yeah, in the back. So, right, so the question is, um, does he posit that the self is constructed anew every time? Um, he doesn't really get into that, and just from other things he's written, my guess is he thinks the self is enduring, that is, it keeps popping back into existence. Every time you open the refrigerator, it's the same light that goes on. But he also, I mean, what he's most famous for saying is, you are completely responsible for every aspect of who you are. That, you know, everything that we do is a choice. Um, and in college, I thought that was a really cool idea. Now that I know more about psychology and neuroscience, I think that's, you know, insane. Um, you know, a vast portion of, of who you are was determined by your genes, you know, before you took your first breath. 
um, out here. But a lot is decided based on your choices, and I think that's a reasonable perspective. Um, but he's more focused on the fact that, you know, the light isn't on when the refrigerator isn't open. Okay? And we assume it is, but it isn't, and we, and we shouldn't assume that. Okay? So what he's suggesting is there's something intimately connected between the self and reflective processing. That you only get the self when you're trying to reflect on whatever it is. Okay. So, okay. what causes us to have a self in the first place? Where does it come from? Where does this reflective processing come from okay. that causes us to think about who we are? Okay. As far as we know, no other animal does this except for us. Now, in Sartre's most famous book, Being in Nothingness, the one that he got the Nobel Prize for, and unlike some other people who recently got Nobel Prizes, um, Sartre actually turned down the Nobel Prize. Um, I'd like to think Obama will someday deserve getting a Nobel Prize. I'm a fan, but really, like, I deserve one as much as he does. <laughs> Right? I mean, like, my brothers used to fight, and I got them to separate. You know, peacemaker. <laughs> okay. Um, so in Sartre's most famous work, Being in Nothingness, there's a lot of really confusing stuff. Um, and maybe you'll feel that about the, the part I'm going to read to you. But there's a section in the book um, called The Look. And Sartre's idea is that the thing that makes us reflect in the first place and think about who we are is this, almost this. Okay? Being looked at, being seen by others. I wish I had a picture that looked like this that was human eyes, but for instance, all the pictures I can find on Google that are just eyes without nothing in the dark, all cat eyes. All. I looked. So he thinks the eyes of others are profoundly important in shaping us having a self. And this is kind of hyperbolic. I don't know that we should take what I'm going to read to you in any way literally, but, but I think it's provocative. Okay? So he describes a scene. He, he describes himself, but kind of a fictional himself. He says, I am in a public park. Not far away, there is a lawn, and along the edge of that lawn there are benches. A man passes by those benches, and I see that man. I apprehend him as an object and at the same time as a man. What does this signify? What do I mean okay, when I assert that this object is a man? Okay, well, we've talked about this, right? Other people are different than just about anything else in the universe. Because when we look at other people and recognize them as people, we recognize that they have thoughts, feelings, perspectives, and so on. So we're all objects in one sense, but we're special objects. When we say someone is a person, is a man, the way he's describing it, that's what we're referring to, is that there's an internal experience associated with that person. Sartre goes on, when I say this object is a man, it means there is a regrouping in which I take part, but which escapes me. A, regroup, a regrouping of all the objects which inhabit my universe. And I'll explain that in a second. The green lawn turns towards the other, this man, a face which escapes me. I apprehend the relation of the green to this other person as an objective relation, but I cannot comprehend the green as it appears to him. Okay? Thus suddenly an object has appeared which has stolen the world from me. The appearance of the other in the world therefore corresponds to a fixed sliding of the whole universe towards this other. Okay, so, what he's saying is, each of us have an experience of the world, and it kind of seems like the world is there for us. Right? It's like I'm the sole viewer in the movie that is my life, watching all of you right now, and whatever it is I'll do in an hour, and an hour after that, and so on, and I'm always viewing that. And we know from subjective construal that my view of that will be different than anyone else's. It won't be the same as anyone else's, sometimes in significant ways, sometimes in minor ways. So when he says the lawn turns a face to that other person that I cannot see, 
He's not simply saying, if I'm on this side, I can only see this side of the grass and he can see the other side of the grass. That's not what he means. I mean, that's true too. But what he means is there's a way that that other person is experiencing the world and it's a movie, an experience for him that I can never experience. Okay? And so suddenly the world isn't singular anymore. If you lived on a deserted island, okay, you would just walk around and you would be the only person having a movie. And so everything would objectively be however you perceived it to be. Because there would be no one to say, well, I see it differently. If you were colorblind, there simply wouldn't be color for those things that you were colorblind for. Right? You need someone else to come along and say, I see things differently, before it ever occurs to you that there is another way to see. Imagine that there is some sixth or seventh sense that some other animal has. Well, it would never occur to us right, if we didn't know about that animal. We would just think, well, touch, sound, sight, smell, those are all the things that you can have, right? Well, no, those are the ones we do have. Who knows? Who knows? I'm not saying I believe in ghosts, even though Halloween's coming up. I'm just saying, who knows? I don't believe in ghosts, but I tell my son I do, because it's more fun. Um, so, okay. So he goes on, and he says, it appears that the world has a kind of drain hole in the middle of its being, and that it appears to be perpetually flowing off through this hole. See, each of us is like our own drain hole of experience. The world seems to come into us, right? There's basically uh, light waves, sound waves, and so on that are being fed into us and then being perceived in a unique way that no one else can ever experience. And to realize that there's somebody else having that same process but a different result in some way makes part of the universe unknowable to us. To know there's six billion people doing that simultaneously means almost everything that is knowable is unknowable to each one of us. Because everybody else is knowing in their own way and we only have access to our one specific, limited way. Now, so far we're not really talking about the self, but here's where he does. He says, if there is an other, whatever he may be, whatever may be his relationship to me, and without his acting on me in any way except by his pure presence... Okay. then I have an outside that can be seen. I have a nature. Okay. So the idea is, when we look around at everyone else, right, we, we see people and we immediately read the book by its cover. Right? We make sense of people around us in terms of the things that we see and we assume that there are enduring underlying characteristics associated with what we see. And he says, my original fall is the existence of the other. I essentially change from being kind of a god at the subjective center of my deserted island to just being another inhabitant with this nature that can be seen by other people. Okay. He says, shame, like pride, is the apprehension of myself as a nature, although that nature escapes me and is never directly knowable to me. So the nature, my nature, that any of you are currently taking in and seeing, I don't have access to it. So you're seeing my nature. We experience other people as having specific natures. That's the extroverted guy, that's the shy guy, that's the athletic woman, whatever it is, right? We, we have these different ways of classifying people. That's their nature, right? Obama has a nature, George Bush has a nature, Dick Cheney clearly has a nature. It's not true. Is that what's it? He's not natural. Unnatural? Okay. Um, shame is shame of self. It is the recognition of the fact that I am indeed an object for the other. In the same way that others are objects for us. Maybe we shouldn't treat them as objects, but we do, right? You know, when I go in the refrigerator, I want to know which things are salty, which things are sweet, which things are going to taste this way, which things are going to taste that way. Well, 
that's kind of how we treat other people too. I mean, not in its entirety, but we treat other people as having particular characteristics that we seek out as they're, as they're relevant. You know, when I was in graduate school, I had my friends who were really fun to go party with and my friends who were really fun to have a sort of deep philosophical discussion with. And I really tried hard not to confuse those two because the one who was really good to have the philosophical discussion with sucked when we went out to parties. Okay? Just thinking, will he ever see this? Hopefully not. Um, in any event, Okay. We try to put other people into categories so that we know what things we do and don't want to do with those folks. Knowing someone's the waiter helps us know how to interact with that person. Okay. We do this all the time and then it gets a little scary when you sort of fully recognize that other people are doing it to you. Okay. Thus, I am myself for the other. Sorry. It is the recognition of the fact that I am indeed an object which the other is looking at and judging. Thus, I am myself for the other in the midst of a world that flows towards the other. Thus, not only am I unable to know myself directly, but my very being escapes me towards the other, even though I am that very escape from my being. So, you have a nature that you will never know directly. It will be known by those around you. And in seeing them looking at you, you recognize that they might be judging and evaluating you and discerning your nature. Okay. And according to Sartre, this is what leads to self-awareness. This leads to self-awareness okay, because we're then motivated to figure out who we are. Who am I? And then how is that person that I am going to be judged by those around me. I want to figure out, am I the kind of person that's going to be liked by those people? Or am I the kind of person who's going to get beat up by those people? Um, or shunned by those people? Okay? I want to know what they think of me and not knowing okay, creates anxiety. So I have an observable object nature, we all do, but we can never know it directly. You can't look inside yourself to know how you're going to be observed by others. But a lot of things in our life depend on how others treat us. So trying to understand how I would be evaluated by others is a major task that we each have. Okay? And this task creates anxiety. And so according to Sartre, anxiety is the fundamental aspect associated with human beings having a self. If there was no anxiety, he would argue there would be no self. I mean, maybe if you already had a self, you'd keep it. But if there was never anxiety in the first place, if there was never worry about what anyone else was going to think about you, you might not go trying to figure out who you are. Okay. And then there's the next step. It's not enough to just figure out who you are. Okay. Um, okay. Okay. We try to actively construct the right observable self for others. Okay. And this can be, not always, but this can be a very conscious, reflective process. So a lot of the things that we do in our lives are designed to make us into the person that we want to be. And the person that we want to be is the person that will be accepted by the other kids in schools, maybe the teachers, my parents, and the society as a larger whole. We want to be someone that will be accepted And so we work hard to make ourselves into someone acceptable, likable, valued. Okay? And so Nietzsche would say that this is the Apollonian aspect of the self, shaping itself to fit with the accepted values of your family, culture, school, whatever it might be. Right. Right. 
Right, so the question is, would you have memories of yourself, okay, um, if there were no other people around? Okay? And, you know, we don't know. There, there are very few people who have been raised by wolves. Um, but, you know, the people that have been raised by wolves seem to have fundamentally different kinds of selves than the rest of us. And, yes, there have been people raised by wolves, if you didn't know that. I don't know how that works, but it does seem to work. Would you have memories? Yes. Would you ever stop to think about them? I don't know. If you were sitting on an island and there was a, like a machine that just kept rolling coconuts towards you so you could eat them and the water was 82 degrees and it was perfect and there were never storms, right? Would you develop a self? Would you think back on past experiences if you never had already gotten in the habit of doing that? I think it's an open question. But I don't think the answer is obviously and necessarily, yes, you'd have a self that looks anything like the selves that you know, we all seem to have here, the selves that somehow support you know, every bad bookstore in a mall having a thousand books on self-help or self-improvement or something like that. I don't think you'd have that kind of self if you lived on that island. But we'll come back to this. There's, there's another piece to, to this equation that one of the next folks we're going to talk about gets to. Um, but this suggests that we are unreasonably concerned with what others think of us and getting us to be the kind of person who will be liked. And our parents are very concerned with us becoming the kind of person that other people will like because they care about our well-being um, you know, as well. And I already experienced this very directly with you know, my two-and-a-half-year-old. Like, is he doing the things in school that will make other kids like him? As if he's going to know these kids 20 years from now um, when they're not in diapers anymore? Nah, eh, probably not. Is, uh, probably not, because I said it's a conscious reflective process. Why isn't it automatic? Um, well, early on, almost nothing's automatic, right? So early on, you know, my two-year-old, even when he was six, nine months old, he was constantly watching what the kids that were six, nine months, a year older than him were doing. Constantly. We would go somewhere like the mall, and he would just watch. And he didn't want to watch the kids that were his age. He wanted to watch the kids that were older. And I think that there was something going on, and you know, of course this is uh, me anthropomorphizing what I can see there, but it seemed like there was something going on there where he was like, I'm trying to figure out what's, go what's going to be important. What are the things I need to learn to sort of become one of them? Um, and I think that that's a very active process. I think if you go look at a fifth grade or a seventh grade, particularly seventh, eighth grade, everyone is absolutely obsessed with, you know, which group am I in, right? Mean Girls was a really nice example of, you know, the different groups you get and, you know, the jungle that is middle school, high school, whatever, and there is a very conscious focus on, like, am I wearing the right things? Am I sitting with the right person at lunch? I don't think that's automatic. I'm not saying there aren't automatic things that support this as well, but there's a lot of conscious reflective processing going on there. Oh, I think there's automatic stuff there as well, but I think the reason it happens at all is because it's conscious reflective. Like, my cat never did that. My cat couldn't care less what we thought of her. <laughs> couldn't care less. Right? It just didn't register because she didn't have the right stuff. Um, and one of the things that she didn't have was conscious reflective processing. She had conscious experience, but not conscious reflective thought. So... I'd like to do a little demonstration, not in class. It's actually going to be homework for you. What? Homework? Now, this is fun homework. And when I say fun, I mean it's fun for me to assign this homework. Um, what I'm going to ask each of you to do, okay, I'm going to ask each of you, um, how many people in here know what lipstick is? Woohoo! Everyone raise your hand. Uh, how many people know someone? who wears lipstick, either yourself or someone else. Okay, so you all know someone who wears lipstick. Uh, what I'm going to ask is that every one of you, before next Tuesday, goes and gets some lipstick, in a bright color preferably, <laughs> and I want you to put some on your forehead. Okay, a nice big visible line, about an inch and a half thick, across your forehead. Um, nothing that matches your skin tone. It's got to be visible. 
and I want you to go out in public for at least an hour. Can do this on Saturday. You can do this on Saturday. Oh, no. never mind. <laughs> wow, this has never come up that close to Halloween. No, you cannot do this on Saturday. Sneaky people. Um, so no. <laughs> okay. Go out for an hour. You cannot do it in teams. You can't go out with someone from here and do it with them. And most critically, you can't tell people why you're doing it. You can tell them something else that isn't true, but you can't tell them the real reason, which is you were assigned by me to do this. Okay. Now, I'm going to ask you some questions to make sure that you understand this. Yeah. What? As long as it's bright and visible, sure. Yes, you can use marker instead, but I would avoid using a uh, marker that is you know, not erasable. <laughs> Don't hold me responsible if you do that. Although it'll be fun to see you come to class if that <laughs> happens. Yeah. You have to be out visible in public. You can be sitting, but you have to be out visible in public. Now. If you have not heard the homework assignment and don't understand it, please raise your hand. Okay, one person. Yeah, I know you were kidding. So everybody understands the homework assignment and everybody is really clear about it. Right? This is probably the most interesting thing I've said so far today, right? Right? It's interesting, which means there's no reason why you would forget <laughs> that this is your homework assignment. And of course, I'm going to post these slides after class. So you'll download them and you'll see this again, right? So it's going to be really interesting next Tuesday when half of you tell me you forgot, okay? And that, that'll just be half of you. The other half of you will mostly make up excuses for why you didn't do it, okay? Uh, but I want you to really go do this, okay? I want you to go do this and it's very relevant to what we're talking about here. And next Tuesday, we'll talk about this at the beginning of class. Extra credit? Nope. I just want you to go spend an hour out in public with this on your head. The, the reflection will take care of itself. <laughs> okay. How many of you are going to do this? Raise your hands, all of you. I gave you a homework assignment. I'm the authority. You gave me the finger on the first day of class and you won't put lipstick on your forehead? Come on, people. All right. What? I should do it also? So after my name, it says PhD. And what that means is I already learned the stuff that I'm trying to teach to you. What? And I've humiliated myself in public on a numerous occasions. Um, so, you know, I don't need to go do that again, but all of you do. Um, so, we'll talk on Tuesday. All right, William James okay. described the self in two parts, uh, but unlike Schopenhauer and Nietzsche, he didn't think they were at war with each other. He just thought there were two parts that were important to recognize. There was the part known as what he calls the me, and the me refers to kind of all those object-like qualities that I and others can know about myself. So if I think of myself as generous, that's part of the me. Okay? If I think of myself as a teacher, that's part of the me. He also thought that like uh, the zip code you live in, the house you live in, the people you're related to, all those things are part of me. In essence, all the things you answered on that question, who am I, he would say are the answers to who am me. Okay, who am me? Um, but he probably wouldn't say it that way. Um, it's that list of enduring attributes about the self. And what he would say is, it's our attempt to create a thumbnail sketch, a sketch like an artist might do, of who we are. And so it's not that we have direct introspective access or anything, but rather we watch ourselves, we notice the things that we th think and feel, and we try to draw inferences like we might about anyone else, and we sort of make a sketch in our head that's not ever going to be complete, it's not going to be fully accurate, but it's a sketch of who we are. 
And then he said, on the other hand, we have the I, which is the active part of the self, the self that's going and doing things, the self that's motivated to go get lunch when it's lunchtime, to study when you want to do well on an exam. There's the self that's the doing self, the experiencing self in the moment. And what happens is parts of that experiencing self, you know, they get saved in memory. So you have an experience right now, and now you go on to the next experience. What happens to that past experience? Well, a lot of them just get lost in the dustbin of history. But sometimes we reflect back on that experience and we say, wow, you know, that, that experience really tells me something about myself. I'm the kind of person who fill in the blank. And once we do that, we're taking something that at one moment was our ongoing experience, the I experiencing the world, and in the next moment it becomes a memory that we can judge okay, and evaluate and say, is that something reflective of me? Okay. The reason why he uses this construction of I and me is because whenever you use I in a sentence, it's the subject of a sentence. And whenever you use me in a sentence, it's the object of a sentence. So somebody gave that to me, me is the object, but if I give something to someone else, I is the subject. So he's talking about kind of the subjective and object, not objective, object aspects of the self. Um, I have no idea why I wrote first ski trip. I could go back and listen to the podcast and get back to you from last quarter. I have no idea why I said that. But what's important is, can our me be wrong? Yeah, it can be wrong, right? We're trying to create generalizations about ourselves, but they're not all right. Did I tell you about me being an introvert? Did I tell you that story? No, I didn't? Okay. So when I went to grad school, I was studying introversion and extroversion, okay? And, you know, I, I was, I had just come from being a philosophy major. I really sort of valued kind of deep thought and kind of people being on their own and focusing. And in Boston, it's snowy all the time, so you're snowed in. And I'm like, I'm that person. And so I was studying introversion and extroversion, so I would take the extroversion scale. And lo and behold, I would score incredibly highly on introversion, okay? As far as I knew, I was like the most introverted guy I knew. And that's how I scored. Like, I wasn't trying to like, fudge the data or anything. It's what I really believed about myself. And I remember talking to a friend of mine. His name was actually Guy. Okay? Um, and I was talking to him. We were taking a bus somewhere. And I told him about my research. And I told him that you know, I was high on extroversion. I think he actually punched me in the arm. And he went, you're not extroverted. You're an idiot. Okay? <laughs> I mean, you're not introverted. You're an idiot, right? Because I'm not. I'm not introverted. I was just wrong about myself. And that probably came from the things that I valued at that time. I valued a lot of aspects of what's associated with introversion, but I was just mistaken about myself. So clearly, we can be wrong about ourselves, or at least I can. Um, and I think that happens not infrequently, although not all the time either. William James said one other thing that's really, really important to a social psychological perspective on the self. This is the statement that, you know, a thousand papers in social psychology have focused on this statement in thinking about and talking about the self. Um, he said, I have as many selves as there are people who recognize me. Okay. Ooh, there were some like, oh, yeah. That's good. I don't always get that reaction in here. Um, so, right. So as we go through our lives and we interact with different people, they basically seem to have keys that unlock different aspects of ourself, and they bring out a certain aspect of us, a certain personality in us. We're different with our parents than we are with our friends. We're different with our college friends than we are with our high school friends. Right? And it's not so much that we're trying to be different. It's that there's some interactive process that they sort of regulate us in a certain way and bring out a certain aspect of ourselves. And so he said, we have all these different selves, and we have one for everyone who knows us. Okay. Now, of course, a lot of the ones are overlapping and similar and so on, but I think it's a pretty profound statement that goes, sort of flies in the face of the idea of there being this one unifying self that I am, and I carry that with me wherever I go, and it's sort of the thing that makes me me. And he's saying, no, it doesn't work that way. The you that's you is different depending on who you're with. Okay? So that's a pretty profound, I think, social psychological statement. Okay, last person we're going to talk about in this lecture. 
Um, so, okay, so Roy Baumeister is a, a modern social psychologist. He's at University, no, he's at Florida State University. Uh, and he has done uh, a huge share of the great modern work on the self. He's the guy, when people think of someone who's done the work on the self over the last 25, 30 years, he's that guy. He does it in all sorts of different domains. And he's a pretty provocative guy. He likes to say things that are pretty out there. Um, and uh, sometimes he ends up offending people, and he's totally okay with that. Uh, but at least that's my impression. One of the things he wrote, he wrote a book called Identity back in 1987 maybe. Yeah, he wrote a book called Identity. And in it, he suggests that our notion of what a self is is a fairly recent event in human history. Okay? He suggests that more or less, if you go back a thousand years ago, just a thousand years, there was no such thing as a self. Okay? Now that's pretty hard, I think, for anyone to swallow. Like, I didn't go out and try to get a self, I just had one. That's how it feels, right? And maybe it's changed and adapted as I've gotten a little bit older or whatever, but you know, it just happened. It's just like having the capacity for language or something like that. We have a capacity for language and it can be different depending on what country you're born and raised in. We have a capacity for selfhood and that self can be different depending on what family, what culture, so on that you're raised in. But the fundamental building blocks are kind of the same for everyone, right? And his argument is that there are certain things that cause the self to come into existence and develop and grow. Okay? And that if you don't have those things, you don't get a self that comes into existence, develops, and grows. So this comes back to the issue that you were raising. And rather than just focusing on other people judging you, as Sartre did, and, and he certainly, I think, would endorse that as one of the things that, that can drive the self, he suggests that the thing that drives the development of the self in the modern sense are sort of the difficult choice points in our life. Okay? So the times when we have to make hard decisions about what we're going to do. Okay? You know, D.D. Reese or not. <laughs> I'm kidding, that would not count. Okay? But when we have hard choices to make in our lives, he said that is a time at which we define some aspect of ourselves. We have this hard decision, and what we're struggling with is Am I the person who does this or does this? I'm debating whether or not to go to law school or medical school. And in that debate, what I'm trying to figure out is, is the person I want to be, is the person I am, the kind of person who would do well and be happy as a lawyer or do well and be happy as a doctor? It's not decided until I figure it out. And so that choice process is a way of revealing to ourselves and to others who we are, what we're made of. And the second half of his insight is that as the world has changed over the last 1,000 years, there have been dramatic changes in the number of difficult choice points that most people have in society. And he's only talking about Western civilization. Uh, he, he's, he's clear to say, you know, I'm not talking about Asia, I'm, not, I'm talking about Europe, and Europe, you know, bleeding over into the places that they founded, like, you know, America, Australia, um, what have you. And so, he said, you know, there were all these decisions that we have to make today that a thousand years ago, in the Dark Ages, in the Middle Ages, people simply didn't make. So, you know, let's go through some of those decisions. So you're born, and everyone's born. That was true a thousand years ago. That's true now. And um, as you grow up, you are going to decide, say, where to go to college. Okay, you're going to decide where to go to college. Well, a thousand years ago, nobody decided where to go to college because colleges didn't exist. Okay, but more importantly, nobody even decided whether or not to get an education. Okay. If you were royalty, you got an education. If you were anyone else, you didn't. So there were no choices with respect to education. Also, he does say 
that something like the modern self might have existed for royalty and heads of state and so on because they did have a different set of choices. But for the other 99.9% .9 of us, that, that's his argument, that there isn't a self. So you're not making any choices about education. Okay. Are you making a choice about your career? Well, today, you're all going to have to make choices probably several times about your career. But back then, there was no choice to be made. If you were a young boy and your dad was the local blacksmith, guess what you were going to be? The local blacksmith. No decision to be made. This was set for you at birth. Completely set. Okay. Who are you going to marry? God, that is like one of the hardest things that everybody deals with now. We meet so many people in the modern world. Everyone has you know, certain attractive qualities, other things that make us wonder, would this really be the right person for me? Am I the right person for them? Right? So much angst, having so many choices. Right? It's really, really hard. But back then, you basically either married the person in the next hut or you didn't get married. Those were kind of your options. And there was a good chance that that was arranged for you by your parents when you were born. So that wasn't something you chose. Where are you going to live? Right? All of you could choose to live anywhere. I've lived in a number of different cities in my life. Okay? I have to choose whether this is the one I'm going to stay in indefinitely. Okay? Um, thousand years ago, no choices about that. You probably were going to be born, raised, and die in the same uh, shack. Okay? People spent their whole lives living in the same house with their, with their parents, and then when their parents died, they were the parents, and then their kids grew up and would live in the same house. Okay. No choice. Religion. People struggle with religion today. Nobody struggled with religion a thousand years ago because there were no choices. Everyone you knew had the exact same religion as you, and there was no discussion or debate about it. Okay. I think that's a, a fair swath of the big major decisions we make in our lives. And for someone born a thousand years ago, there's a good chance that they would not have to make a single one of those decisions. And so those choice points where you try to figure out what kind of person am I, they're not present. Or at least they're present in a far smaller degree. And he would suggest that the more you have to go through those choice points, the more you're going to see the development of the modern construct of the self. So let's start over there and then we'll come back. Yeah. So that's the thing is that there were no rebels. There were no suicides a thousand years ago. Like suicides, for the most part, a relatively modern construct. Uh, suicide didn't really take off. Uh, until the 1800s. <laughs> like, suicide is a pretty modern construct. It's not that no one ever did it, but it was a very rare thing. And Roy Baumeister, who's actually written books on suicide, said suicide is largely about, you know, shame of self, and that if you don't have a developed self, that's one of the reasons you don't see suicide. Oh, he would certainly agree that there was personality, but my cat has personality. Right? You might not like my cat's personality, but cats have personality, animals have personality, it's verifiable. But I don't think personality is the same thing as identity. Okay? So, you know, there are lots of people who decide, you know, these are the things I value in my life, these are the goals that I want to set, and I identify with those goals. I identify you know, with my religion, my culture, whatever it is. And I can do that whether I'm extroverted, introverted, neurotic, not neurotic. Um, so personality, he would argue, has probably always been there and roughly the way it is today, but not selfhood, not that awareness of self as this thing that needs to be taken care of and developed in just the right way to be suitable to, to everyone else. Yeah, he would basically say that they either don't have a self like we do or that it's a much more sort of degraded primitive form. Not because they were more primitive people, but because their social lives were so set for them that it didn't force them to spend the time thinking. It's a little bit like saying, 
you know, what would have happened to Michael Jordan if no one had ever given him a basketball? If he had never touched a basketball, would he have become the basketball expert, legend, whatever? You know, there are sort of capacities that we have, but we develop them through practice, expertise, reflection, experience. And what he's saying is the self part, you know, he would say in the modern world, we're all self-experts, at least in Western civilization. We think a lot about ourselves. We think about who we want that self to be in the future. We do things to make sure that that self becomes that person we want to be. Um, we do all these things actively. And so we have all this experience developing this expertise with the self and how it relates to everything else. And those folks, a thousand years ago, they didn't go through that experience, so they didn't develop those kinds of expertise with selfhood. What's that? What about the Amish? Uh, my stepmom grew up near the Amish in Pennsylvania. Um, I don't know that much about the Amish other than like awesome beards. Um, but no, I mean, no, in, in, in seriousness, um, if the entire world was nothing but Amish, I think you could argue that, oh, well, maybe they don't have the same choice points. But I think actually being Amish in this world today might lead to a lot of very intense, serious choice points. You know, when, when they turn 16, like, they're literally forced to decide, are you going to stay or are you going to leave, right? What bigger choice point is that? Leave your family forever or stay and be part of this world that's so different than everything else that, that's out there around you. Um, so I think that, you know, we could think that people a thousand years ago were kind of like the Amish surrounded by nothing but Amish. Um, which is very different than being like, you know, here's a hundred people who are Amish and you're constantly seeing, you know, Porsches drive by on the highway a hundred yards away going, why doesn't my horse pull my buggy like that? <laughs> um, so, it, you know, it's complicated. Yeah. Right. Um, I mean, it just sounds like arrogance. Um, there was, I mean, so there was this thing when, you know, the United States was being founded, there was this concept of manifest destiny. I don't know if that's the term you're thinking of. I'm betting it isn't. But the idea was because we're sort of moderns and the Native American Indians who were here were uncivilized, which turned out to be nonsense, um, that somehow it was kind of appropriate for us to take over for them and kind of treat them like children because we were like the adults and they were like the children. I don't know if that's exactly what you were getting at. But What's that? No, 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 no. Sorry, I think you've misunderstood him. Um, first of all, he's talking about us, our own ancestors. He's not talking about some other culture. But I don't think... Um, to say that some other group doesn't have a self is hardly um, an attack on those people. Okay? His lab has also done a lot of work showing, as Sartre suggested, that having a modern type of self dramatically increases the level of neuroticism in society. The more developed self you have, the more anxiety you have, the less sort of comfort with your life you have. So I don't think he's by any means suggesting that it's a good thing to have this modern thing that we describe as the self. He's simply saying it's different today because of these circumstances. I don't think he thinks that's um, you know, a really good thing necessarily at all. So um, you know, I, I think that's different than what he would suggest. Now the last thing I want to talk about um, today is the evidence that he generated for this hypothesis. Okay? Now, of course, as a modern psychologist, you can't go back and run the experiments. You can't say we're going to run one condition of people from the modern world, and then we'll go get some subjects who were born in 1100 AD, and we'll run them next to each other and see which of them have more developed self-concepts. It doesn't work that way. And so he had to take another approach. And his approach, which I think was quite clever for someone trained as an experimental psychologist, was to go back and look at essentially the cultural artifacts over the last thousand years. Okay? He went and looked at things like um, uh, the diaries 
that have been written over the course of those thousand years. Autobiographies, the novels that have been written, okay? Um, the way any written stuff characterized mental states and wrote about them. And what he finds sort of with each of these different uh, indices that he looks at is that you see this development of more of those things occurring kind of per person in society as industrialization occurs, as kind of religious conflict develops, as these things occur that kind of create each of these new choice points where people move into cities where they have more choices of who to meet, where to work, where to go to school, and you see a tracking of the development of artifacts that you would expect to see if there was sort of a modern self-concept there. So a thousand years ago, there was no such thing as a diary. Okay? The only people who wrote anything remotely like a diary were um, you know, the aristocracy. And even when literacy developed over the next couple hundred years, you still didn't see people writing about their own experiences. People didn't write in diaries. And what is a diary but me reflecting myself and my experiences to me for further analysis, for further consideration in some way? Okay. You don't see that developing until these kinds of conflictual choice points are arising. And you see this in all the sort of cultural artifacts he looks at. Does that prove that he's right? No. It doesn't prove that he's right, but I think it's very suggestive. I think it's very interesting um, that there is that tracking. Did you know that people didn't use mirrors till the 1700s? Like, the mirror basically didn't exist. The only people who had mirrors were priests and kings. Okay, nobody else had them. So most people would live their entire lives without ever seeing their own reflection. Think about that. Think how different that is than the life you all live now, where you see your reflection constantly, everyone spends time in front of the mirror, there's pictures being taken of you perpetually, videotape, so on. Yeah, sure. If you were at a water or lake, you could see a reflection, but it's not really the same thing, right? You know, I don't know that people are like, I have to decide what to wear today. I'm going to go down to the lake and try on different outfits and be like, <laughs> stop dumping stuff in the water. Now, one of my favorite, favorite things, incidentally, I'll just quickly tell you a story. I've got one more slide to show you, but um, so when I first started going to conferences, and I met Roy Baumeister, he was one of my heroes. Um, but the first time I met him, I didn't realize who he was, and I went up to him and said, hey, Dan Wagner. Um, and he and Dan Wagner are good friends, and I think they kind of look similar. And they, you know, 15 years later, still will not let me forget which of them, you know, that, that I did that 15 years ago. Um, so here's one particular artifact that I find particularly fascinating. And again, it's just one little piece of data that you can either take as bearing on Baumeister's hypothesis or not. Okay? But I think it's interesting. And if you know this um, because you've had art history or whatever it is, don't go shouting it out. I want people uh, to experience this who, who haven't seen it before. So um, this is a famous painting by Jan van Eyck. Okay? He was a Dutch painter in the 1400s. And what he was particularly well known for was bringing this incredible sense of detail to painting. So painting, for the most part, um, had been trying to be representational going back to ancient Egypt, but there were so many things that they just couldn't get right to really make it representational where it looked exactly like real life. Okay? And so some of the things that this painting is particularly known for is that if you see a, an original version of it, and I have seen the original of this, you can basically see every hair on the dog, and they're all falling the way hair naturally falls on a person. And then the other thing okay, that's really striking is the draping. It's incredibly hard to do realistic looking draping well, and he was one of the first who really, really got it precisely. Um, so he was famous for these reasons. Uh, but this painting is very famous for another reason for our purposes. Okay? Can anyone who doesn't already know from before what I've told you, can you guess why this is important to social psychology and Baumeister's theory? Yeah, he's reflected in the mirror on the back. I'm guessing he knew that already. 
because it's impossible for you to see that from there unless you see a close-up <laughs> of the mirror. Okay? But what's striking about this okay, is here's the two people being married, and here he is in the back painting himself into a painting. Now, what's significant about this is that this was painted in 1434, and it is the first time in the history of painting that you ever see the artist appearing in their own work. Okay? The whole modern construct of art, postmodernism, is all about putting my subjective construal, my filter, on the page so that it is in some way or another a representation of me and my experience. Back then, the height of what they were working on was to trying to get essentially what a photograph would look like. But even still, no one had ever thought that they themselves were an appropriate thing to include in any manifestation in the artwork. Okay, so this isn't the beginning of art, right? Art goes back thousands of years before this. And this is the very first time, and this is right when the Renaissance is starting and all these things are happening, where selfhood starts developing, and you see self-portraits beginning not too long, within 100 years after this. They didn't exist before then. They just didn't exist. Yeah, there was a question. Okay, so I think that this is a very provocative piece of evidence. Um, of course, we can't evaluate Baumeister for sure, but I think it's an interesting idea. And we'll move on to self-control on Thursday. I have to run. Please don't come ask questions now because I don't want to have to ignore you. But I will. <laughs>